Right then, welcome back to another vid, another Games X vid. This one is issue number 10 from the 27th of June to the 3rd of July back in 1991. Where does the time go? Absolutely unbelievable. So, uh, yeah, on the front we've got Mario vs Sonic. What they essentially do in this game, as well, in this game, in this magazine, as we'll see shortly, is, uh, is a, a comparison and rate them both out of five and uh, give the pros and the cons. This issue came with a disc for all ST and Amiga owners. Uh, you get little little Bew, little bow, and Switchblade 2, which was more my cup of tea. I remember getting this uh, demo disc, this magazine, and thinking, I can't wait to play Switchblade 2. Absolutely loved it. And I think it's reviewed in this mag as well, so um, yeah, we'll have a look at that in a second. A couple of previews there, F14 Tomcat and Megalomania. So let's crack on in there. First thing we see, Civilization. A game which obviously is still coming out now. So uh, that's lasted the, the test of time there. Um, what else have we got? Anything sticking out? Thunder Jaws. That kind of looks interesting if it wants to focus. There you go, which it finally does. Super Space Invaders. Yeah, I remember when this game was uh, just about to come out and it looked really good. It looked fun. Um, it blended in that kind of cartoony look, as you can probably see there, with old school Space Invaders. And if anyone's seen it on my channel, I'm sure other people on YouTube have covered it before, but around about this time there was a video released, a VHS video, uh, called Click. Uh, they released two, I think. The idea was to release one every month, and it was basically a video gaming magazine on, uh, on VHS cassette. It didn't last, clearly. Uh, but in the first episode, like I say, which I've got on my channel, it lasts about 45 minutes or an hour, um, they previewed or reviewed, I can't remember, this Super Space Invaders game. So a very nostalgic game for me, uh, like many other thousands are. And um, and it was alright, I think it was a little bit panned, I think, in the reviews. But kind of, you know, like a 75% kind of game, uh, or maybe even less. But I, I thought that was a bit harsh. I thought it was decent. Not amazing, but uh, pretty decent. Check that face out. What's going on there? So, uh, yeah, Martian Dreams, that looks pretty good. Looks very good, actually. And then whatever that is. So, yeah, let's uh, crack on to the, the next page. Not really a great deal going on there. I'll check this out. Radio Luxembourg. So this is like a little partnership. I mean, I haven't read the whole article. But essentially, I think the general uh, gist here is that Games X, the magazine, teamed up with Radio Luxembourg to have like a regular, uh, regular feature which is, which is pretty interesting. I never listened to Radio Luxembourg. Um, you know, listening to the radio wasn't really something I did back in the early 90s. Although, with that said, I did listen to uh, Radio 5, which then is, what is it now, 5 Live? Uh, because sometimes they'd have the, uh, the football on, and I wanted, wanted to listen to the football. Because back then, you know, the football games just weren't on TV. It was like one or two every now and again, uh, whereas you get one or two a day now, don't you? So uh, it was just, uh, just the way that you kept up with their football scores. And it was funny as well, because I was speaking to someone the other day, just about this era in general, and um, they were saying, and it reminded me as well, of like, if you, if you missed out on your football team's score at the weekend, you know, the only way you'd find it is in the newspaper. But if you didn't read the newspaper the next day, sometimes it was like a week or two later when you found out how your team had done, which is just ridiculous. Sandy Beach, is that something? That surely isn't his real name. Surely isn't. Maybe it is. Um, but yeah, how funny is that? I mean, you know, and in this day and age, you can just go on the internet, find everything at the click of a button, which is fantastic. But I kind of missed, in a way, that naivety um, that, you know, that the early 90s, which is comparatively recent. You know, it's not a long time ago, not really. But the world has changed just incredibly. It's just amazing. Anyway, that'll save that kind of nostalgia uh, for another day. Willie Beamish on the, uh, on the Amiga, I think that was. Maybe the PC as well. It says ST there down the bottom too. So yeah, just I think just a graphical kind of um, point and click adventure game. I think this is pretty pricey to get on eBay if and when it appears. I think it's pretty uncommon. But a game which I've wanted for a long time. I remember seeing it in this magazine and others at the time and thinking, that looks amazing. And of course, you look at that, it still looks amazing. Who can look at that and think it looks rubbish? Looks great. Just looks like a cartoon. But whether that's actually uh, just a still... Or, or what, I'm not really sure. Well, clearly it is a still from a magazine. What I mean is in, in the actual game, was well, it's just like, is it a cut sequence? Is it a gameplay? I'm, I, I don't know. And now this is interesting, if it wants to focus. Let's look at this. SNK will be launching its long-awaited super console, the Neo Geo, at this year's Computer Entertainment Show, held from the 5th to the 8th of September at Earl's Court. 
The system was previewed at last year's event, and it was hoped that stocks would arrive before Christmas of 1990. The only negative point about this superb 299 console system is the software prices. These will range from an incredible £99 to an unbelievable £149. There are currently around 10 titles available, but another dozen or so will be on the shelves by the end of the year. Among the games out for the launch will be Nam 75, Magician Lord, Super Spy, Riding Hero, Professional Baseball, Top Players Golf, Puzzled, Ninja Combat and League Bowling. Others to follow will include Street Fighter 2, that never happened, Sengoku, King of the, Fe uh, King of the Foiters, King of the Foiters, if you're from Birmingham, uh, King of the Monsters, uh, <laughs> I should say, King of the Monsters and Ghost Pilot. King of the Foiters, I like that one. Um, <laughs> fraudulent slip. Yes, but that that is interesting because Street Fighter 2 just did not come out on the Neo Geo at all. Unless I've completely got that wrong, I've never seen it. Um, but that's, that's yeah, it's very interesting. But yeah, with the Neo Geo, it was a it was a system which everybody at my school, maybe everyone at yours, if you're a similar age to me, we all wanted it, but we knew we were never going to get it. It was certainly not in the early 90s, and so we never really treated it that seriously. You know, what was the point? Because we couldn't afford the system, we couldn't afford the games, no one had one, uh, so that was the end of that. We just kind of looked at it with a little bit of envy, uh, but not too much envy, because like I say, it was it was unobtainable, so we never worried about it. Um, as an adult, I have thought about buying one. Uh, I have bought a few games in the past, uh, you know, added a, a, or formed a little bit of a nice collection, uh, but just ultimately never really felt the need to uh, to get the AES. I have had the Neo Geo CD, and if I'm completely honest, um, I didn't think it was all that, personally. I thought it was all right. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't, at the time, what I was into. I just thought, I can't be bothered with this. It was around about the early part of the millennium, and quite frankly, at the time, I thought the PS2 just pissed all over it, so I just preferred the PS2. So that was that. So in the future, an AES or a, a Neo Geo CD... Yeah, I may go there. I may. We'll see. But no real intentions anytime soon, I've got to be honest. Um, Robo Zone down there, which looks pretty... Looks like a game called Metal Mutant, or even Walker by Psygnosis, if anyone remembers that. And then you've got uh, Chaos Engine by the Bitmap Brothers, which was a brilliant game. And uh, the sequel, I don't think I've ever played the sequel, or maybe I have. And that looks like a fatter version of Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear in the middle. But it isn't. It's one of the Bitmap Brothers. And then we've got some of the games that are coming out. Wing Commander 3, sorry, Wing Commander 2, down the bottom there. Um, Blade Warrior, that's an interesting game. It's kind of like, from memory, I think it's almost like a sort of a noir kind of graphics. Um, it looks amazing. If it's the game I'm thinking of, it looks really good. Uh, but playability-wise, I think it's poor and extremely repetitive. Um, but yeah, it looks very nice, and I might feature it in a, a pickup vid and maybe even a gameplay vid in the future. But that's for them couple of adverts there. ADS, Advanced Destroyer Simulator. And then we've got Panzer Kickboxing, a game which I used to really, really like. Reminds me in a way, even though this is kickboxing, I don't know if anyone, uh, anyone watched it the other night, the, the boxing between Carl Froch and uh, George Groves. What a fight. It was really, well, it's really tactical and slow to begin with, but the knockout punch by Carl Froch, bloody hell. Completely sparkle. Good night, George Groves. <laughs> it was unbelievable. His legs just buckled big time. And, uh, and that is that. Now, really, and this isn't obviously a boxing vid, quite clearly, but Carl Frotch should retire now. How can he top that? 80,000 people at Wembley, uh, a knockout punch, what a way to go out. But he's probably going to carry on and fight in Las Vegas. Um, you know, whatever. It's his career, uh, obviously. But um, it would be a good way to go out, I think, if he decided to retire now. And he's 37, I think, next month. So, you know, he's technically, I guess, got a couple of years left, but really he should be thinking about... Um, packing it in, but his decision, obviously. Anyway, Gallup Charts, Eye of the Beholder at number one. Now, this is like a, an all-format top 20, so all uh, 8 and 16-bit um, systems. Uh, they kind of, I guess, take the average of what games are in their position for the reflective systems and put it all together. And like I say, kind of a law of average, this is how it works out. So Eye of the Beholder at number one, and you can see the rest yourself. Number eight, Dizzy Collection. Kickoff 2, number 15. Gods, number 18. Pretty much the same chart that you would have seen in the last few issues because, you know, it's only a, a week after the previous mag, so nothing really is going to change uh, too much. I think that's is that Super Monaco GP up there. I think it is. 
and again Gods, which is a brilliant, brilliant game with great music. Absolutely love it. Public apology? What's going on here? Oh, uh, that's ridiculous. So I think they're just apologising for having cheap prices. Clever. I see what they did there. So that's that. The cover disc experience. Now this is interesting because obviously we've got Switchblade 2, which we uh, discussed at the start of the vid on the front cover. We've also got this one, Little Bew, or Little Bow. I think it's Little Bew, but I could be wrong there. But we've also got Warzone. I didn't see that picture on the front. Now, Warzone is an amazing game, an extremely nostalgic game for me. I did a gameplay vid of this a long, long time ago. In fact, currently, it's on my main channel page as my video, which you'll automatically see uh, if you clicked on that channel page. And I think on that vid as well, I, was, I couldn't remember where I discovered Warzone. I think I said it was on the front cover of a magazine on like a demo disc. It could have been Games X or it could have been ST Action because I'm pretty sure that magazine had a, uh, a demo disc of Warzone as well. So yeah, it could have been this very magazine that uh, where I first discovered Warzone and it's a brilliant game, a really brilliant game. If you love stuff like, uh, say, Ikari Warriors and Mercs, you will like Warzone, and you should definitely check out the gameplay vid I've done. Not because I've done it and I'm the man, uh, although, you know, there's uh, maybe an element of truth behind that, <laughs> but because, uh, you know, joking aside, because it's a great game, and I think if you love the Amiga, you love the ST, uh, maybe the 8-bit gener uh, generation, or just the 16-bit generation, or gaming in general, and these kind of top-down shooters, then you've got to check that game out. It's really good. Right, what have we got next? So we've got a Commodore 64 Special. And I think, what does it say there? Commodore 64 owners, wait, don't panic. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, you know, from the previous page on the front cover, occasionally there was a demo disc for Amiga and ST owners. But if you had a Commodore 64 or a Spectrum or an Amstrad, then you were kind of screwed a little bit. Uh, well, not a little bit, a lot. Um, but basically what Games X was saying here, particularly, specifically for Commodore 64 owners, is if you, I'm trying to read it there, what does it say? If you, uh, basically, I think it's to do with saving the coupons and sending in a small fee, um, maybe a couple of quid or maybe even less, they'll send you a Commodore 64 tape. So a nice little way for Games X to earn more money and to sell more magazines. Very, very clever. So they're talking about some of the best ever Commodore 64 games. Um, you can probably read some of those yourself and see the graphics. Yeah, I've never had a Commodore 64 myself, but I've played on it a lot over the years. I was an Amstrad guy, you know, back in the day. A very staunch CPC fan, absolutely loved it. Uh, but I had many friends who had a Commodore 64 and who had a Spectrum. And in fact, there's that's good timing, poignant timing, because a particular friend of mine, who I still speak to every now and again, called Rob, uh, he used to love this game, Creatures. And he used to, it used to wind me up, and he used to wind me up, in the sense that it didn't come out on the uh, Amstrad. I think it was a Commodore 64 exclusive, uh, or just a Commodore exclusive. Maybe it was on the Amiga 2. And uh, it looked really good. But even though it used to wind me up, I, when I played it, it was all right. It was a good game, but it's nothing. Some, uh, it's not something which I was absolutely desperate to have. But it did annoy me the fact that, irrespective of the fact that it wasn't, I didn't think amazing. It did wind me up that it wasn't out on the Amstrad, and he was kind of getting one up on me. That kind of frustrated me <laughs> as a CPC owner. But uh, yeah, a decent game for me, not amazing, but um, but decent, like I say. Then we've got Navy Seals on the Commodore 64 cart. Was it called the C64S or the CS or something like that? And it was bollocks. I tell you what, and I'm not just saying this again as a staunch Amstrad fan, but if you thought, if you, if you thought, if you thought the GX4000 was a disaster, uh, which it was, then you've seen nothing yet because Commodore's version of the console was even worse. It looked terrible. It was awful. Absolutely rubbish. But no one ever talks about that. Let's all slag off the Amstrad. Let's conveniently ignore Commodore 64's uh, console, shall we? <laughs> I'm not bitter. 20 odd years later, 25 years later. <laughs> but yeah, that's that. And there's a competition there to win. Um, what is that? Like one of those. Um, oh, I thought it was one of those Sega CD things. It's just a Discman, a Walkman uh, with, with a CD on. Here we've got Special Reserve. So just showing some of the, the bargains that they've got on offer this month. Anyway, we've seen all this before. We don't need to see it again. Ah, now this is the uh, the comparison, Sonic versus Mario. So, yeah, two classic um, characters. Obviously, got your Super Mario and uh, your Sonic the Hedgehog. Showing the the graphics, uh, talking about the pros, the cons, um, all the rest of it. It's just a general surmising of the two games, talking about their impact and how good they were. And they were really good games. Now, I was more really of a Sonic guy. 
Um, I've never played, to my knowledge, uh, an 8-bit NES, NES, call it what you will, uh, Mario game. I know they're kind of, uh, you know, pivotal parts of gaming history. They look good, I've never doubted that, but it's never really been my thing. Um, I've played the uh, SNES versions, and again, I thought they were alright. I can see why people like them, but it's never been something which has made me think, I've got to get that, they're brilliant games. Not really, but like I say, I can see why people do uh, think that's the case. But yeah, it's um, not really my thing. Sonic, I did enjoy a little bit more. But again, I wouldn't really go too overboard with either of them, <laughs> in all honesty. But brilliant games in the, the grand scheme of things, I will give them that. Now, somewhat predictably, it gives them both 5 out of 5. Although, if you look at the scores there, in terms of gameplay, last ability and presentation, then Mario does come out on top. But I guess ultimately you do have to give them both 5 out of 5 for uh, for the legacy, really. And both games are still going now in some form, aren't they? So that's that. We've got some budget games. Now, curiously, budget games used to always look really good, but more often than, than not, they were lacking in playability. I mean, look at Colorado down there. Graphically, it looks nice. Hostages doesn't look too bad. What else have we got? Maya? Maya? That looks all right. North and South? Well, that's a really good game. But yeah, really cheap games, but um, graphically look very good. Playability, sometimes they were all over the shop. F14 Tomcat on the PC, so just a flight sim, as you can see. Looks pretty good. So that's that. Four out of five. We have Hunter. Now this game is really, really good. I think it still looks nice now, to be honest. I mean, dated, clearly. But I think it, at the same time, it, it, it holds up somewhat. It looks, well, that's maybe a little bit too close. It's going to look rubbish if you do that. But yeah, um, this one's reviewed for the Commodore Amiga, but also came out on the ST. And I think later on in this mag, um, there's a little mini review of the ST version as well. But I, you know, spoiler alert, I think it gets the same score. Four and a half out of five. But yeah, it's kind of like um, a 3D... Um, it's almost like an open world game, really. Uh, which, at the time, I was blown away by. I thought it looked good. The freedom that you got uh, was fantastic to go on these little, as it says there, go for a spot of windsurfing, <laughs> which is pretty funny. You can get in your jeeps, you get in your helicopters. Quite an advanced game, you know, for its time, and uh, one which I'm definitely going to get back eventually. Next up, we've got Halls of Montezuma on the Amiga. Three out of five. Sorry, four out of five for that one. So, it, yeah, just kind of a Sim City game, essentially. Um, now, if I'm honest, I do find it hard to go back and play these kind of games just because of the graphics, and I'm not a graphics whore, I do like good graphics, um, but playability and immersion is obviously the most important thing, and I'm sure I'd have fun with this, but I would much rather play something like Age of Empires or like a Port Royale 3, which I've just recently picked up, uh, on the 360, or a Tropico or something like that. But still, 4 out of 5, it's clearly a decent game. Cricket, imaginatively titled on the uh, Amiga, one meg, and it gets a grand total of two out of five. Yeah, it doesn't look too great. Um, in fact, it doesn't even want to focus. Ah, oh, there we go, maybe it does want to focus. It doesn't look too bad, I guess. Uh, relatively basic, possibly just above the acceptability levels, I think. But yeah, Cricket, two out of five, um, I think it says it all. Jackie Chan, now check this out. It, graphically, it looks all right, you know, in a very cutesy kind of platform way. <laughs> Check that guy's beard out. Look at the big heads as well, very Japanese style. Um, in fact, looking at that, I wonder if it was a Japanese release, this one. And this is on the PC Engine. 35 quid, three and a half out of five. Next up, we've got Hardball. This one is for the Mega Drive. Three and a half out of five. Yeah, if you like your baseball, I guess it's a, a decent game. But... I'm not really into it. I've seen a few games uh, live, and it's all right, but I, I struggle to get into it. Everyone at work talks about it all day long, so I know a little bit more about it than I did, um, but I, it's, it's not for me. Baseball is not for me. Okay, so we've got the mini reviews here. First up is Moonbase on the Amiga, and at the bottom here it mentions uh, fans of SimCity will love Moonbase, four out of five. So, um... That's not the first time. I think I mentioned SimCity a minute ago, didn't I? Hunter on the ST. So yeah, here's the mini review. They're basically just saying it's pretty much the same as the Amiga version. So four and a half out of five. And it was the Amiga, ver sorry, the Atari ST version that I had back in the day. 
um, but they kind of look and play the same. Prehistoric on the PC, platform game, 4 out of 5. Sharky's Mole on the Amiga, which just looks like a, a very cheap imitation of Operation Wolf, 1 out of 5, so clearly not a, not a particularly good game. And Switchblade 2, uh, as I mentioned at the start of the vid, um, a bit of a mini review here. Uh, for the Atari ST, 5 out of 5. I think the Amiga version, was it reviewed in the last mag? Or maybe it's the one coming up? I'm not sure, but um, yeah, a really good game. And as I've touched upon before and in the past, and will do in the future, one of many seemingly thousands of games which are very nostalgic to me. Winner Super Famicom. Don't mind if I do. 0898. If you call, you will not win. A couple more um, mail order companies there. We've got Tipex with some cheats, so if you have any of these games, you may want to pause the, the screen. I'll just kind of quickly go through it, because like I say, you can pause it. Xenon 2, Chips Challenge. I remember when that came out uh, for the Atari Lynx, and um, it looked kind of interesting. A puzzle game, and I do like a puzzle game for my sins. Flood, and last but not least, Total Recall, which is a really hard game really tough it'll be interesting to go back to it if i do like a gameplay for that because the last time i played it it was really difficult we've got a guide for toki i know some people pronounce it toki uh, i've called it toki since 1990 or 91 so i'm not going to change now just through stubbornness <laughs> retro stubbornness and it's just a platform game it looks quite nice um but that's that and then we've got super off-road racer which in four players uh, is fantastic or three or two for that matter uh, maybe even in one player it's still fun. But yeah, good memories of this. And um, a really playable game, even today. It's just similar, as you can see, it's like a super sprint. Hold the button down to accelerate, finish in, uh, finish in first position, pick up the nitros and the usual thing. We've got a ZX Spectrum special here. Again, much in a similar vein to what we had earlier on in the mag with the Commodore 64. Uh, it's just a case of, you know, save... Um, uh, a couple of uh, discs, I think, send in your cover disc, send in a quid or two, and they'll send you in return a ZX Spectrum cassette with games on or demos on or, or however it worked. So here we've got um, Spike in Transylvania from the Coldmasters. It doesn't look too bad, I guess, if you like that kind of thing. And then up here we've got Spectrum All-Time Greats. So counting down from number 30 all the way down to 21, and I think maybe in the next mag they'll do the... Uh, the rest of the, uh, the counter, maybe from 21 or from 20 to um, 11, I guess. So let's take a look at a few of them. Night Law, I used to have that on the CPC. I did like it. Jet Set Willy, of course, is a classic. Elite, well, there's many classics here. New Zealand Story, again, loved it on the Amstrad. Uh, and then latterly on the ST and the Amiga R-Type. Yeah, there's a lot of really good games here. Another one I remember from the uh, Amstrad, Saber Wolf. Operation Wolf, which we mentioned before. Um with that cheap imitation called Sharky's Mole. Lords of Midnight, again, another one I had. Uh, I think I had that on the um, Amstrad, or maybe I'm confusing it with Lords of Chaos. Maybe I am. Robocop, brilliant game. So that's that. Okay, so we've got the Gallup charts from All Systems on the Amiga, Eye of the Beholder, at number one, much like it was for the all-format charts. Cricket Simulator, number 10, Speedball 2. There we've got the Atari ST, Lemons at number one. Warzone, number eight, brilliant game. Again, as I mentioned before. On the Commodore 64, Supremacy. Creatures at number six. As an Amstrad owner, I was jealous, but I wasn't, as I mentioned before. <laughs> uh, on the Spectrum, Dizzy Collection. Sabutio at number nine. Yeah, I remember getting that again for the CPC. Wasn't very good. Speaking of CPC, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles at number one. Yeah, that was a decent game. Total Recall, number seven, Shadow Dance, number eight. Fun School, uh, Fun School 3, for five to seven-year-olds. Why well, I was older than five to seven, I didn't have Fun School. And I'm not about to get it anytime soon. And then on the NES, Super Mario Land at number one. Revenge of Gator, that sounds familiar. And budget labels, again, as you can see, just look at that. Dominated by Codemasters, number one, number two, number three, number seven, number 11, 13... Yeah, I mean, what's that, six or seven out of the top 15? That, that's crazy. More mail order companies. There's quite a lot of these, wasn't there? When you look back in hindsight, so many people selling stuff, um, you know, trying to get your money. And half the time you ordered from them, and of course it didn't turn up. That happened to me on numerous occasions. They take your money, and they ran. 
<laughs> the naivety again of the early 90s. Just couldn't get away with it these days, although they still try it. Dr. X, with his usual blend of seriousness and complete sarcasm, as you may see in some of the, um, the answers. Again, if you really want to read it, you can, you can pause it. We'll just quickly go down here. There's gods and a little drawing of Dr. X. Supercars 2 there. What a game. Quite a pricey game for the ST and particularly the Amiga, but uh, well worth it. We've got a feature of Megalomania, so the guys at Sensible Software. Uh, John Hare there in the middle. John Hare there. John Hare there with the long hair. There he is. So yeah, um, Sensible Software, although obviously this feature is on Megalomania, which was a very good game. As you can see, similar to uh, like Powermonger, Populous, uh, those overhead kind of strategy games. Even though this is a feature, like I say, on that particular game, uh, of the making of it and uh, the, the ideas behind it, um, I think really most people will know this company for Sensible Soccer, which is a brilliant game. Although controversially, perhaps, I've always, even at the time, I did love it at the time, but as the years have gone by in, in particular, uh, I've, it's quite a limited game in what you can do, the amount of goals you can score. There's just running in diagonally or running straight and curling it. There are a few other you know, variations and variables, but ultimately it's quite a limited football game. Uh, but the depth of it in terms of players and, you know, and especially sensible world of soccer, um, you know, that's a really good game because it, it involved and introduced the, the management mode, which, which is uh, brilliant, was brilliant and is brilliant. Um, but yeah, I think Kickoff 2 really is a more of an in-depth football game, uh, but it's just hard to master that game. And I think that's why a lot of people... Um, don't really mention it because it's a very difficult game to play, is, uh, is Kickoff 2. Um, but that's that. So yeah, we've got console connections. Abraham's Battle Tank there on the Mega Drive, 86%. R-Type on the Game Boy, pretty hard to work that out, but 80%. And look at that, the NES on tape. That's an interesting uh, article there. And they're also talking about a Nintendo NES handheld. I don't know anything about that. So uh, again, you can always give that a little read, if you're interested. Sega CD update. And it's just interesting really to read about a lot of this stuff, because there's many news articles and many games featured in this mag, and a lot of mags uh, back in the day, uh, where they talked about games that actually never came out. They talk about systems which never came out. But at the time, you know, they were, um, they were rumoured to be inevitable, you know, on the horizon. Musha, or Musha, on the Mega Drive. Yeah, I see a lot of people in the in the old gaming community on YouTube picking that up, and it looks like a decent game. 92% as well. What else we got? Go Go Tank on the Game Boy, 71%. And what Game Boy collection is complete if you do not have Rescue of Princess Blobet? <laughs> 82%. So that's that. Ah, now Street Talk, the greatest feature ever. This one's from Peterborough. Let's have a look at what some of them are wearing, uh, more importantly, and what they're saying. I used to have a top like that. Um, it wasn't a shell suit. I think it was more like a tracksuit top. Um, <laughs> the fashion was brilliant. Unbelievable. So David Griffiths. I've got a Mega Drive, and I think it's amazing. I've got eight games for the system. My favourite one has to be John Madden's Football. I am thinking of getting a Super Famicom when they come out, but I'm sure they're going to be expensive. I've been into games for a year, just a year, and I like playing and watching football. I support Everton. And then the art editor said, who? So I'm guessing he's a Liverpool fan. Anthony Frost. Do I really have to tell you what I've got? I've got a Spectrum 48K, but it's fine for playing games on. The games I buy for it are budget titles, and I do like the Dizzy games a lot. Usually I buy a game a week, but only spend around three quid on them. I really like the Nintendo. The games are superb. The plug-in and go system on the Nintendo is great. It's a pain waiting for my specky to load. Yeah, the days of, of putting a tape in, waiting three hours uh, and it being ready. It wasn't three hours, was it? But it was, what, a good 20, 30 minutes? There's Michael Smith. Again, he's got a Mega Drive. Um, usually buys a game a month. Looking for Thunder Force 3. Interesting. Duncan Wiley. Looking very cool there. Uh, uh, Elvis-like. Or maybe more Shaking Stevens-like in, uh, in his denim jacket there. PJ Golf Tour fan. He's got an Amiga. It's the best machine I've ever seen. Look at that. I work in McDonald's at the moment. It's not a bad job, isn't it? But it beats going to school, does it? I think I'd rather go to school personally, but um, we're all different. What can I say? Angela Jukes, over 21. <laughs> 
I'll look at that at the end as well. The magazine he reads is less compute. That was a bit of a faux pas. You should have said Games X. <laughs> oh, let's come to Len um, in a second. Uh, Len. Steve. Um, there we've got the uh, Mark Gibson, I think, is the uh, is he deputy manager. No, he just works there. For nearly two years, I've been working full-time in the shop. I really enjoy it. I own a Game Boy and an Amiga. I've had the Amiga for about a year and a half, and it's by far the best machine around at the moment. Most of the games available on the Amiga are superb. My faves would have to be Kickoff 2, again, which I mentioned before, and Armageddon. This magazine is weird, because I always seem to mention something, and then later on in the mag, it comes up again. Now, whether I'm psychic, or whether it's just because I know this era, so I bring things up which I guess are inevitably going to be mentioned, uh, maybe that's more of, of what it is uh, but it's kind of a strange kind of weird fate that it always seems to happen julie hookstep 26 she looks an interesting character my parents and i share an atari st a oh, good good point to be fair uh, so a little bit of kudos for that they use it mainly for business but i use it for playing games on my favorite games are pang and Poznik. yeah pang's a really good game actually at the moment i'm thinking of buying hero quest i've heard such a lot about it my interests include photography and I also coach a local ladies' hockey team. Good for you. And then we've got Steve, the manager. So what's he saying here? Um, Amiga software is selling well, especially Eye of the Beholder, as we've mentioned a couple of times already again. The customers are mostly in the age bracket of around 16 to 30, but we do get a lot of older people coming in to buy business software. Um, if I get a little time to myself, I usually pick up the Game Boy and have a quick go on Tetris. We do a lot of Game Boy titles, quite a few of them are imports. And there's Steve, an extremely proud man, with his um, collection behind him. Top 10 bestsellers, Eye of the Beholder, obviously, as he touched upon. Um, WWF Wrestling, brilliant. And Power Up at number 10, which I think was a, a compilation from memory. I'm sure it had a game called X Out, which a lot of people call Cross Out. Maybe it is actually called Cross Out. I'm not sure. Again, more business things. A sneak preview of the secret weapons of the Luftwaffe for the PC. Uh, just, you know, the usual kind of flight sim game. Go Global. Now, I think this uh, feature uh, either ended for the next issue or the issue after, which was a shame. And it would talk about all the movies and things that were coming out at the time. Um, uh, music releases. Uh, things that were on TV, as you can see, and also items which were available for sale. Like, does anyone remember this? Cadbury's milk drink. So this would have come out around about this time. We've got the seltzer drinks, which I do remember, but I can't remember what they tasted like. There's that. There's the big kind of stereos, which everyone had to have at the time. Cassettes, which were cool. These little kind of watery games, if anyone remembers them. That one was called Yeah. <laughs> and the other one was called Ah, as you can see. And then you got the guy there looking really cool with his with his little Walkman. You've got the letters page, so offering nothing particularly new there. Look at that. What a happy couple. And uh, a preview of next month. And then, of course, on the back, it's the obligatory win an arcade machine. But uh, you have to call 0898. Uh, and you, uh, you're you not going to win, so don't worry about it. Don't bother paying, because nobody ever won. So that's that. Games X Magazine from the 27th of June to the 3rd of July, 1991, issue number 10. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.